So routines and rituals. Well, I don't know about you, but I've never really been the sort of person that's been naturally attracted to routines and rituals. As an educator, of course, much of our life is ruled by routines and rituals, isn't it? But in the last 18 months, I have to say, there've been certain routines and rituals that have really anchored me. You know, in a world of uncertainty, and there's been so much un uncertainty and lack of control, certainly in the last year or two, they provide some certainty. I'll give you some examples. So every night now, actually, <laughs> every night, I actually lay the breakfast table with my favorite porridge bowl. And I've sourced lots of different bowls, and this is my favorite one. My favorite little handcrafted espresso coffee cup. And I know the next morning, same time, I'm gonna be in the kitchen, stirring my proper porridge in a saucepan. I haven't reached the stage where I now actually sort of count the number of stirs. I'm not that obsessive. But I do know that I'm gonna be pouring my favorite porridge into my favorite porridge bowl, drinking my favorite coffee in that nice little handcrafted cup. And that is a routine that anchors me. So work-life balance, well, have you ever mastered it? I don't think I ever have. It's just my life. You know, when it's a passion, a calling, a vocation, which I think teaching and school leading is, education is, is that sort of craft, isn't it, that consumes everything or it can consume everything. And it's a bit of a mashup between work and life because it's a passion. But that's not necessarily good enough, is it? I think it's still worth having a balance. Well, one of the lessons I learned from the many brilliant courses in the Pathway Programme was from uh, a terrific author and a very experienced school leader, David Gumbrell. And David says, do you know, one of the best ways of achieving balance and that sense of perspective and reflection is sleep. And it's, and we all know this, don't we? And perhaps we need to remind ourselves sometimes that though we may obsess about the power levels, you know, the battery charge levels on our phone. And if you're anything like me, I'm always checking the little icon in the top right hand corner to check that, uh, you know, there's enough power on my phone because I've forgotten my charger. We never um, perhaps pay the same attention to ourselves, our own power supply, our own battery. Well, you know what? David Gumbrell on the Pathway Programme says that our bed is our charging pad and we need to charge ourselves up efficiently and adequately every night. We need to have adequate sleep. And having enough sleep is the best influencer, I think. It will have the most influence over our ability to make sensible, rational decisions, keep a sense of perspective, uh, manage our own emotions, keep a sort of a sense of self-regulation, self-management. And uh, I think above all, it actually gives us that sense of balance as to what is important and what isn't important in life. So one of the many courses on the Pathway Programme that I, I really enjoyed um, making was with um, the brilliant course leader, Andrew Jeffrey, highly experienced teacher and trainer and author. And he delivered a course called Time Management and Self-Organisation Skills. Well, that was definitely something I needed to sign up for because anyone who knows me knows that my time management and my self-organisation skills have never really been an absolute strength. And that was the same for Andrew Jeffrey. And interestingly, if he were here, he would tell you himself that at the age of 50, he received a diagnosis of ADHD. And suddenly everything made sense to him. The reason why he reacts the way he has done in the past, the reason why his job list, his list of priorities is somewhat mixed and he's easily open to distraction sometimes, needs to attend to something and finish it before moving on to something else, shiny and new. All those different symptoms, if you like, made sense to him. And so Andrew said, right, well, now at the age of 50, having had this diagnosis, I'm gonna turn this into a strength. I'm gonna make this an area of strength rather than an area of development. And so he shared a few techniques with me and they're brilliant. The first one, of course, is terrific. And he calls it the blockage job. It's not a very nice image, but we actually talked a lot about a sink plunge in the course, actually. You should see the course. We actually have a sink plunge in it. And he says, there's always a job that you least want to do, the one that you least want to do during the day, the one that you really are putting off. And he suggests that is the blockage job. That is the job that you keep putting off, but that affects everything else that you do. It blocks your creativity, blocks your motivation, blocks your enthusiasm, your well-being. Get that job done first. Do the task that you least want to do first, the blockage job, and hey presto, it will clear the way for your productivity and your creativity and your well-being to flourish during that day. Motivation, well, it's one of those invisible, nebulous things that kind of just is beneath the surface. Um, I'm a little bit cynical, or I have been cynical about that word. It sounds like the sort of thing, perhaps, if I were a management consultant, a life coach, I'd talk about, maybe write a paperback book about that you might find in the Heathrow, Heathrow Library, getting on a plane, reading something about motivation. Well, maybe that's just me being cynical. I'm no longer as cynical or sceptical about that word motivation now. I've really thought about it. And the person who's helped me is a terrific uh, former school uh, senior leader, teacher, and now author, uh, Mark Turner brilliant expert in the world of motivation. 
and I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to make a course with Mark on motivation, a guide to motivation within the Pathway Programme. It's the first course in the programme. And the reason we start with a guide to motivation is because we genuinely think motivation underpins everything else. We know when we've got it and we know when we don't have it, but we don't always understand why. <coughs> It's worth actually just reflecting on which is the hour in your day when you feel most motivated and when do you feel least motivated and starting to reflect a little bit on your job description. Well, many of us, certainly myself included, when you get a new job, whether it's in teaching or school leadership or, or whatever, you don't always go back to the job description. It goes in a file or you keep it on your uh, folder in your computer and you don't really return to it until perhaps you might, I don't know, need a reference or something and you move on to the next job. In the Guide to Motivation in Pathway, we encourage you to fish out that job description again. Go through those roles and responsibilities and tasks and really reflect and think. And as you're doing them each day, be mindful of what you're doing and consider how is this affecting my motivation? Am I feeling the fire in the belly? Am I really feeling that adrenaline? Am I feeling a sense of enthusiasm for what I'm doing? And when also am I not feeling that at all? Being more mindful of that, certainly with our Guide to Motivation, means you can do more about it. You can actually understand what motivation feels like, understand what to do, and also understand how to cope when something is really demotivating you. We share some strategies for coping with things that demotivate you, because we're always going to do some things that don't really keep us motivated. But understanding we all have different motivational drivers, understanding what it is that motivates you can really help you to flourish in your job. So, a guide to motivation, certainly worth a look. Yes, I was that irritating leader who would stand on the school dates on a Monday morning and say, happy Monday to everybody as they came in. Probably wound more people up than I cheered up. But you know what? I do think optimism is such a, a fundamental part of being a teacher, of being a leader, and also being a student. When we have optimism, as you'll know from that brilliant book from Martin Seligman, Learned Optimism, when we have optimism in our learning, we react to any sort of critique any assessment, examination results, any time we're given some sort of appraisal, we react to it more positively because we have self-belief, self-motivation, and we're able to self-discipline, and we're able to see the point in carrying on, to see the point of trying hard. And do you know what? When we present optimism, both to others and to ourselves, the funny thing is better things seem to happen. And I've tried this. There've been many a time, many a time in teaching and in leading, certainly, when I felt glum, when I've been drawn towards pessimism, but I've actually flicked the switch. What I mean is I've always visualized in my head a giant light switch, one of those old-fashioned brass ones, and I've pushed it. And sometimes it takes quite a heave, actually. And those are the times you need to move it most, when you push the switch from pessimism into optimism. And yes, you have to fake it until you make it. But you know what? As teachers, we present unshakable belief in the students and unshakable belief in our colleagues, don't we? We need to present and project the same unshakable belief in ourselves. And I think that starts, whether we like it or not, with optimism.